Hi everyone, welcome back to Lies, the section of extra history where we tell you all the things we screwed up, uh, broke, or otherwise did badly. Uh, oh, and where we get to tell you all the interesting anecdotes we couldn't fit into the series. Uh, today I'm here with Jack and with Rob, who's hanging out with us from Hong Kong. Um, and to begin this, uh, do you guys want to say a quick hello? Hello. Hey. All right, that was awesome. Well done, folks. Uh, so... Many of you pointed out a small audio flub that we did uh, where we mentioned that the Mali Empire lasted until 1930. It did not indeed last till 1930 at all, and Mansa Musa has never worn a fedora. Um, all right, so on that note, uh, I wanted to start and talk a little bit about sources, especially the sources early on for sort of the rise of the empire. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, epic of Sunjata? A lot of people were wondering how accurate this is and how much of our information we draw from that. So we have uh, addressed a similar question um, in the Genghis Khan series, and what those two uh, stories have in common is that they both used oral histories. Um, and with most oral histories, uh, they do contain some elements of real history and some uh, fantastical or, or sort of um, uh, fictional elements that might have made their way in in the retelling. But for most of human experience, uh, the point of recording history wasn't for simple record keeping. It was to uh, commemorate events, to pass on stories, to pass on moral lessons. So we can still learn a lot about the people who were telling these stories, even if a number or a, a fact or a figure might not be true. Great. So um, with that, uh, let's talk about some of the myths that may have evolved around Mansa Musa, because this is the big one. This is the one that everybody knows. Everybody knows from civilization. Uh, so a lot of people were wondering, is Mansa Musa really as wealthy as we we're talking about? Or is that something that's sort of, you know, one of those tales that's grown over time? Uh, yeah, so he really undeniably was, uh, we can pretty surely say that he was the most wealthy person in human history. The just amount of wealth that he had um, was not even comparable to anyone else in his time. It's probably true that some details um, about his Hajj and, and uh, uh, the amount of spending that he actually did in Egypt could be exaggerated, um, but that's not really the most important uh, piece of understanding his story, even if there were uh, not 60,000 people on his train, um, he still just had more wealth than anyone in the world uh, had or ever has since. Awesome. So then let's talk about the uh, the money, because besides gold, another currency um, was cowrie shells. And we talked about cowrie shells back in the episodes on paper money and how they were the widest distributed and longest used currency in the world. But why did uh, the Malians use cowrie shells if they had so much gold? A lot of places where they used cowrie shells was because they didn't have precious metals. So there are actually four types of currency in the Mali Empire. There's gold dust, which we talked about. Uh, there's gold nuggets, which as soon as they come out of the mines, all go into the royal treasury. They're all owned by the king. So that gives the king a lot of purchasing power, but also uh, make sure that the market isn't just completely flooded with gold uh, in a country that's producing it. Uh, there's also cowrie shells, which, interesting thing, Ibn Battuta actually saw cowrie shells being shipped out of the Maldives uh, and well, kind of wondered where they went. And it turns out they were going to Mali uh, and other parts of Africa where they were used as currency. This was probably a more normal, everyday method of exchange, but at least later they inflated to such an extent that you needed baskets of them, thousands of little cowrie shells to buy even a piece of cloth. Uh, and the fourth one is salt that people would carry around in blocks and just cut off pieces of. Uh, and it could be traded like one-to-one -one with gold sometimes. Hmm. And tell me a little bit about that salt importance because I know we talked about trading it south. Um, why, I mean, other than, I mean, it's a preservative, but why is it so important and so valuable uh, at this time? And what are the little economics going between the different parts of Africa right now? So salt isn't just for preserving food, though that's a very important quality, right? Uh, it's also necessary for human life. For you to retain water, you mm -hmm. need salt. And in an equatorial jungle where salt isn't naturally occurring, you just need imported salt if you're going to stay alive. Right, especially you when you sweat a lot, especially if you're going to work in a mine or work anywhere. Yeah, makes total sense. Um, yeah. So getting back to even Batuta, who you just mentioned, uh, 
there's this kind of sense that he was a jerk. Uh, he was kind of a pretentious jerk. Is that accurate or did I get a wrong read from some of that stuff? Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, so, yeah. accurate and a wrong read. I like it. Uh, so, yeah. Sorry, which was that a yes to? Yeah, uh, it's both. All right. Uh, Ibn Battuta was kind of a jerk. Um, he's famously, the word that frequently gets used for him is a busybody. Hmm. He's sort of all up in everyone's business all the time. Um, to be fair to him, he was a judge. He was a judge of Sharia law. So he's supposed to be policing people's behavior and how much they're uh, adhering to the tenets uh, uh, of Islamic religious law. Judging people is his job. Um, but having said that, he was very famous for this one incident where he came into a city and he went to the bathhouse and uh, he was immediately struck by the fact that it's basically a locker room. Like a bunch of guys are walking around without towels on. They're walking around nude in the bathhouse. And he's so upset about this that he immediately runs to the governor and instead of saying, hey guys, maybe put on a towel, he goes and institutes a religious crackdown on proper dressing in the bathhouse. So he sort of liked to uh, sort of escalate things. He was very much a like teacher, you didn't give out homework, you know, kind of guy. Uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, again, like partially that's his job. And also uh, when he's going around asking for gold, it was a pretty common thing in the Islamic world for if a visiting scholar showed up, uh, that you would give him some money to establish himself in a city. Maybe you'd call on him for advice or help or to try some cases. Uh, so it's partially to cover their expenses and kind of thank them for coming to your court. So from his perspective, this is how he'd been treated all across the Islamic world. Mali is one of the only places where he's, this is not happening and he's given food instead. Uh, so there's probably a little bit of, uh, uh, his saltiness is maybe a little bit warranted uh, just from his perspective. But um, I just also want to point out that uh, Suleiman not wanting to give him money uh, that's a little bit speculation on our part. It's not a lie, but we wanted to make sure that you knew that that was our read of it. That wasn't necessarily in the sources, um, but it's always been kind of this question of why uh, why that happened. Was he just stingy? And in my in my uh, estimation, it's like, well, if you're the guy ruling after Mansa Musa, probably being a little you know uh, a little thrifty is responsible, you know. So, uh, talking about travelers like even Batuta, uh, whatever happened, it's one of the coolest parts to me, but whatever happened to that fleet, do we have any idea what happened to the Malian fleet that they had sort of sent west and then, I guess, disappeared? Um, have we discovered where, where it went? So there's uh, no record uh, that we know of has ever been found of the ships hmm. or of the fleet. Rob, however, does know of a Malian scholar named Gausu Diawara who wrote a book trying to track Abu Bakari II's uh, journey. And in their work, they claim that uh, the fleet could have landed in Brazil. Unfortunately, none of us writers of extra history have been able to read it for ourselves because it has not yet been translated into English. But if you are on the hunt for the for the missing fleet, uh, that is probably your most promising source. So another thing I was really curious about that uh, I know some of the YouTube commentators brought up as well was this issue of Mansa Magan dying of sleeping sickness. I know there's a story about that. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so this this may be a lie. Uh, we're not sure. So that was a story I came across in one of the sources. There really wasn't anything except dark rumors always sort of swirling succession, even during the Golden Age. This is kind of an ongoing thing with rulers of the Mali Empire, right? Where they sort of die in accidents or in weird circumstances. Uh, there's even a story that there actually was no exploration fleet, and this was just a story that Mali the Musa concocted to cover the fact that he ousted his predecessor. Uh, so there are often like rumors about this. Uh, this is this was a good way to put that in and sort of hint at their these changeovers in power may not have been 100% natural, uh, even during the Golden Age. I don't know if I 100% believe it was actually an assassination. It could be one way or the other. I'd say maybe to 40 percent chance of assassination um but i wanted to put that in because we we just didn't have time to go through all the counter narratives of like or maybe he was murdered you know so 
I like the fact that we are now taking odds or like doing meteorological forecasts. I was going to say. There's a 30% chance of murder today. Grim forecast. Yeah. From uh, Molly Empire. But moving on to something a little bit more serious, I want to talk about the use of this term Berber uh, because I know it isn't necessarily the original term. Uh, can you tell me anything about this, this terminology, why we're using it, and um, sort of where it came from? Yeah, so uh, Berber as an English term is the one that uh, showed up in our sources and that is widely used by major news networks um, to refer to a specific uh, ethnic and linguistic group. Um, so because of this, we were not aware that this term uh, can have uh, an offensive context. So uh, we figured the best way to make amends for that would be just to acknowledge this here in this episode and also to add that their self-identified name is the Amazing, and there is now an effort uh, to make that more, the more widely uh, used name for that group in particular. I'm glad we at least got to cover that and go over that because I think that is really important. Um, it's really interesting to me also, I'm sure they're linguistically totally different, but how much it just struck me as the same as barbarian, right? Like you have the same uh, weird phoneticism to it um, and it has that same sort of meaning, right? Like a lot of, if memory serves, the uh, Arabic groups that were using it were using it to mean foreigner or outsider. Right. Yeah, so far as I know that that is correct, that it's a very similar context. Before we go, because I know we're running out of time, and I wanted to make sure to ask both of you if there were any stories that you couldn't fit in that you really wanted to get into these episodes. Yeah, I have one about Sunni Ali. You always know that I have a hand in an episode if there's a big desert and then a navy shows up in the middle of it because I love in the middle of the desert power. <laughs> yeah, in the middle in the middle of the desert, the Sahel, um, <laughs> in the uh, Niger River Delta. Um, so we talked about the brown water navy, the the, uh, the riverine navy uh, created by Sunni Ali uh, for the Songhai Empire. Uh, I love this so much, and there was a story that I, I didn't get to put in there, and I was really sad we cut it out which is that uh, he liked fight, fighting from boats so much that when he decided that he was going to capture Walata, Walata, remember, is on the edge of the uh, edge of the Sahara. It's, uh, it's a desert oasis town, right? That's where Ibn Battuta first lands when he uh, goes across the Sahara uh, and into Mali. Uh, he decided that he was going to capture this by besieging it with boats. And to do that, he tries to dig a canal all the way across the savannah, all the way to Walla. <laughs> and uh, so that they can fight from their boats. And uh, after a few years, it's clear like this is not going to work. Uh, so they just abandon that effort. And uh, I think they actually did carry a few boats by hand uh, there just because. Uh, I just, I love that because I think it shows you so much about him as a person. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, let's exit this with a Walpole fact, because you know who, until last year, was the British ambassador to Mali? It was Alice Walpole, a scion of the Walpole family. So to this day, uh, the Walpoles are messing around in this piece of history. And um, also, if you're watching this, the music video has gone live. Uh, so if you like the music that came up at the end of these episodes, the Kiners did this fabulous piece. You can listen to the whole thing. It'll be on another video that's gone up on the channel. It should be up right now. Um, and finally, next week, Join us for the history of non-Euclidean geometry. I am super excited for this one. If you want your brain burnt and want your mind bent, uh, you should definitely be checking this one out. Uh, so Jack, Rob, thank you guys for joining us. And uh, thank all of you for joining us too. Take care, everybody. See ya.